My name is Siobhan Adcock, and this is the story behind my story. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Devon Adcock. Thank you so much for tuning in to Author Stories. Uh, we really appreciate you listening. If uh, you would like to subscribe to the show over in the right-hand sidebar, there are some handy links where you can click and subscribe on your iPhone or your Google Android device uh, or listen online or YouTube or Stitcher Radio. Pretty much anywhere that you listen to podcasts, you can subscribe to Author Stories there. We would like to uh, thank our sponsors today for sponsoring the show. It's because of their generous support that we're able to bring you so many great author interviews and we'll be uh, calling out those sponsors throughout the show. So uh, thank you to them. As always, stay tuned at the end of the show for an audiobook clip from our good friend Richard Glebes. Thank you so much for listening. Now on to our show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm really excited to have Siobhan Adcock on the show with me. She has a brand new book called The Completionist, and this is a fantastic book, y'all. Uh, I think you're really going to love it. Uh, welcome to the show, Siobhan. Thanks so much, Hank. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? My gosh, what a great question. Um, I was writing, like a lot of writers, I was writing when I was a really little kid and um, coming up with stories that uh, I think were just about my imagination and the world that I was in. But the first book that I wrote was a, um, a children's book about being jealous of an older sibling called Libby Can Do That. It was a you know, page turner about how unfair and unjust it was that older siblings can do what younger siblings can't. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, what, were you a, a bookish kid? Did, did you read a lot? Yeah, I definitely was. Um, our house had a huge kind of floor to ceiling bookshelf that my father built for us in our dining room. And a lot of times what I would do is just kind of sit underneath this giant bookshelf kind of in the shadow of the bookshelf underneath the kitchen table and just read everything I get my hands on. And I had a bookshelf like that, that my father built for my sister and I in my room as well. Um, and we, we just packed it full of stuff and read from a very young age and read every day. I love that. Uh, what kinds of things yeah. uh, did you like to read? Um, well, when I was a kid, you know, I, I read the things that all kids, all girls growing up in the 80s did. I had my share of Sweet Valley High. I had my, uh, <laughs> I had my share of, um, I also really got into Stephen King and was um, very into uh, his books for a long time. I, I continue to think he's just an amazing writer. You know, he's written however many, 40, 50 novels now, and every single one of them reads like a house on fire. And he's just so funny and has a great um, insight into human beings and why they do what they do, even in sort of strange and otherworldly situations. Um, so I read a lot of his work. Um, and I also really loved um, sort of just stories about day-to-day -day life and relationships between family members. I remember really loving the Betsy Tacey books by Maud Hart Loveless and also the Anne of Green Gables books, which are really about a bookish young woman who kind of finds her own power through reading and a love of words and, and also um, kind of finds her own family along the way. Right. Right. Um, I, I love those books. You know, they, um, yeah. they there's something about, I, I don't care what genre you, you know, you think that, that you are a lover of, uh, there's just something empowering about Anne's story. And, and like you said, that, that she really found her freedom and her voice through, through a love of words. And, uh, you know, what writer cannot connect with that? 
Yeah, she's really like the original book nerd, you know. <laughs> she has such an overpowering love of language and stories that she kind of can't even really live in the real world. <laughs> you know, everybody has to kind of work around her in the world that she's in, which is, um, you know, that's the power of imagination and also one that she's able to kind of harness for herself as she gets older. It's a great series for for girls, for readers, for anybody. She she made it okay to look at the world differently. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So so after uh, your your debut uh, with the the sibling book, um, what was the what was the the next <laughs> thing that you wrote? Were you did you continue writing through <laughs> school, or did you do like like a lot of us do and kind of put it away for a while, and and then that that writing bug comes back to bite you later. Yeah. You know, I, I love hearing other people's stories about sort of how they started writing because everybody's stories are different, you know. Um, for me, I was just kind of writing throughout um, junior high and high school. It was a real um, escape for me and something that um, that I was trying to take very seriously, you know, in high school. And so a lot of my stories in high school were very violent and dramatic and, you know, just reflected just the turbulence of being a teenager and um, when I was in college, um, I think I kind of took a turn toward humor, um, which I think helped me out a lot. <laughs> when I, uh, one of the, the best experiences that, that I had later in life as a writer was to teach a humor writing class, which I, I have to recommend for anybody who wants to write, whether you want to write funny or not. It just kind of teaches you about how important it is to be precise in your language and how humor can open up even a very serious story and make it more acceptable to people. So um, after college, you know, I had, I had a bunch of like short stories that were a real mishmash of um, serious and funny and funny, but sad. Um, I worked um, in digital publishing and traditional book publishing for a while after graduating from college and then finally went to uh, get my MFA, um, which is a, for me, it was a great experience. I know an MFA isn't necessarily for everybody, and it's certainly not necessary for everybody. You know, it's not like it's like a stamp of approval or anything. But for me, it was a really nice um, community. It was small. It was supportive. Um, it happened to be, you know, not one of those MFA programs where you have to take on a ton of debt to participate in it. And after having worked for a couple of years after college, like just having the opportunity to um, take a couple of years to write and think and sort of explore my own voice as a writer um, was so valuable. Um, So I came out of that with, um, you know, like the novel that you throw in your drawer, right? So everybody's got one of those, at least one. Um, And it was sort of like a, you know, connected short stories about um, sort of making your own family out of the parts that you have lying around, kind of picking up that like funny but sad um, voice and, and applying it to, you know, modern families and and what they look like, how there's different families for different people and different needs and um, different ways to love people. And all of them are are good. Um, So um, that, that novel's still in a drawer. Who knows if it'll ever come out, (laughs) but um, I was uh, working in publishing again after my MFA program um, and um, had my daughter um, and Ironically, I found that becoming a mom was like this real accelerant for me in terms of the pace of the writing that I was turning out. Didn't happen right away, obviously. You know, when you're when you're dealing with like the newborn days, you're not doing any kind of writing at all. <laughs> but um, about seven months after she was born, and after I had gone back to work, um, I started a novel that was a a ghost story about motherhood and work that um, ended up being my first published novel. And I wrote that in about 18 months. And, um, and so that was my, my first book, The Barter. Um, And so since then, I think I've really been writing about, uh, I've been writing about motherhood and family and um, kind of setting those uh, explorations of motherhood and family in uh I guess, I don't know what, how else to put it, but like weird world. So the first story was a, a, the first book was a ghost story about motherhood. And this new one is sort of like a dystopian fiction mystery um, that deals with motherhood and how we define it. I I see a lot of threads in your writing and I, I can definitely see that, uh, that Stephen King 
uh, early influence in in the, the oh yeah the, in the tension <laughs> uh, and uh, but you know what one thing I love about Stephen King and and I love when when other authors um, kind of kind of get it uh, is that uh, you know he he's classified as a horror writer and some of what he writes is horror for sure um, but you know what uh, underneath so much that, more. Oh yeah, underneath all that, you get these great human interest stories. So these these stories of of how people interact with each other, and then when supernatural things happen to them, you know what their reactions are. But you know, at, at the beginning of every great Stephen King book, you've got the small town and characters that you can absolutely connect with. Everybody knows somebody like that, or you may be one of those characters. Um, you know, and, and then we get to see how people respond to the stuff that happens to them. Uh, and, and there's a great yeah. mix of tension and humor and family. And uh, and, and I love that uh, that you do that as well. Um, is that a, a conscious thing that you do? I know you talked about teaching humor writing and and and, and that's an absolute skill that that you that you have to learn to nail because bad humor uh, is probably worse than mm-hmm. bad, bad horror. Um, you know, it just it, yeah. <laughs> it, it hits you in a visceral way that this is bad. Um, but is, is that a conscious thing that you do in your writing to make sure that you have all of these different elements and that you're hitting kind of the range of human emotion? Yeah, what what a great question. And I really love what you said about Stephen King. I think that kind of captures what he does so well. Um, and, you know, and, his book on writing is, sorry, go ahead. I, I was going to say, and be warned, I ask like 15 questions at once, so I apologize. But. Yeah, no, that's cool. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try this. <laughs> I'm going to take my notes while I'm listening. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, you know, I, I, his book on writing is a writing manual that I return to over and over again, when, especially when I hit a block, you know, he just has that way of opening things up because I think, like you said, what he does so well is that he has such an incredible range. He, he goes from the like side crackingly funny to the stomach clenchingly terrifying in the space of 10 pages, sometimes 10 sentences. His characters are so real and so recognizable. And that's what makes his stories work. Um, I think at his best, he really just kind of presents humans to uh, back to ourselves in this mirror that, you know, like there's scary stuff going on in the background, but you can really absolutely see yourself in it. And I, I think, you know, I do consider myself or try to be a realistic writer about humans and our relationships with each other, even in worlds that may not be familiar in the way that, um, that King does. And, you know, many other really great writers do, but, you know, I think he's like the one that we're talking about is a great example of this. So I, I, I do consider myself a realistic writer um, in the sense that I want to write about people that seem real and doing things that seem recognizable and true, but then also, you know, put that through a, a, a filter of, you know, inserting those real relationships and people into a, a, an environment that's unfamiliar or uncanny or strange or challenging in some way. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's a conscious it's got to be a conscious choice. Yeah. Yeah. To the yeah. extent that you're doing anything consciously as you're writing, right? Right, right. <laughs> so much of it. <laughs> you feel like you've got a cup to your ear and you're just listening to something and trying to write it down as fast as you can. Right. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, when you had your daughter uh, that things tended to speed up and, and became uh, kind of more immediate for you, you know, this, this need. Um, did it, uh, did it ever occur to you or was it conscious on your part um, that uh, after having a child and this, this beautiful experience that, that your, your writing uh, turned kind of dark <laughs> after that? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because I think that motherhood is, um, it is beautiful, obviously, and it's life changing, but here in America, it is also very, very challenging. Um, you know, one of the things, that I think has impacted my writing is that, you know, my day job for the last 10, 20 years has been working in um, publishing, working mostly for um, women's sites. So, um, you know, parenting and community and sort of women's lifestyle and women's service sites. And, you know, one of the things that you are confronted by over and over again is how it is, how difficult it is 
in America in particular to be a mom. Um, we have the worst family leave policies in the world. Um, 40% of births in this country are paid for by Medicaid. Um, half of the children in this country qualify for free lunches. Um, like there's, there's just a real lack of, um, you know, the support networks that make motherhood um, easy and beautiful, let's say, right? Like it's, it's always going to be this amazing life-changing experience that, you know, I would never have not done in a million years, but there's so many ways in which as a culture, we are kind of failing parents and, and moms in particular who are expected to kind of carry extra burdens in so many ways still, you know? So, um, so that was, very much, you know, proven out to me in my own personal experience. And then also just professionally every day, you're kind of reading these stories and um, in these online communities with women being real and honest about what the experience of motherhood is. And it's, it's beautiful, but it's hard, 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 you know. And um, that's, I think, one of the reasons why I keep returning to motherhood as a theme or as a, I guess maybe like a plot device in the fiction that I'm writing these days is because it's not just that I want to write about how amazing it is to be a mom. Um, although I, I think I do. I also want to write about how challenging and how um, strained and stressful it is and how, how we could do better. Right. Right. I, I think that's, uh, I, I think it's a very natural um, response that uh, to, to, uh, to be kind of hit in the face with, uh, with, with mortality and the, uh, yeah. the kind of how, how dark life can be, especially when you see this, this beautiful life that's perfect. And, and even though that, and I absolutely agree with what you said about the circumstances around it can be terrifying and, and so, uh, uh, you know, uh, disproportionate and it's just, it's a tragedy. I, I completely agree with you. Um, but you know, I, I think as writers, it, it's a it's an honest response to start thinking about um, uh, as a way to balance that, or maybe to to allow ourselves to think the worst things about life, um, so that mm, we can yeah. deal with that in our subconscious uh, through our writing, uh, so that hopefully we we don't deal with that in real life. Uh, do, do you think that's true? Yeah, I I think that's really well put. You know, I I think one of the things that was kind of fun or interesting about writing a, a novel that's sort of in the dystopian tradition right. that is a, also about motherhood is that those two things, they have so much in common in some ways because they, they force us to confront who we are, what we are, right? Like in dystopian worlds and in parenting, there are all these startling differences from a world that you thought was familiar. And there's weird technologies that you have to master <laughs> and there's, you know, reductions of basic freedoms and there's, you know, like new rules and authority figures that you have to learn how to live with. And um, like the motherhood and dystopia have these, you know, <laughs> common touch points in so many ways. And I'm saying, you know, I'm saying it lately, but it's also, you know, it's, it's just like a, an interesting, um, you know, amplification, I guess. And um, so for me, that, that very much is what I think the best, um, dystopian fiction is about is about that um, confrontation of not just you know like the world as we imagine it in the future but also the world that we're living in now every dystopian book has in it a a, a view of the world that we live in right now um, and I think um, you know that kind of preoccupation with the future and what's it going to look like that's also got a lot in common with the experience of being a parent right and you know, you're sort of uh, constantly looking down the line, looking down the line, worrying, obsessing, trying to change current events so that they impact the future. Um, and, you know, that's, I think that that was very much in my head as I was writing this new one. Too. Um, so tell us about The Completionist, the new book, uh, with, with this little uh, kind of dystopian uh, tilt. Uh, mm -hmm. to it. Where did this book come from and who are the characters that we're going to meet? Um, well, you know, it's, it's funny. I I think that I didn't realize that I was writing a dystopian book until um, after I had the original idea. And I don't know if that makes sense, but the original idea for the book came from, I, I got my hands on these letters home from Vietnam that my own father wrote um, to his older sister when, he, you know, he's about 19 years old. He did two tours of duty in Vietnam as a Marine. And, um, 
you know, was very young, um, forced to do terrifying things, um, discover things about himself that he never thought he'd see. And then in the meantime, there was some stuff going on back home with um, their youngest sister that was just kind of scary. And so these letters that I was reading um, from my father to his sister about their sister and how even in the middle of this war zone, while he's trying to be a brave man and a, a good man, he's also trying to be a good brother and a good man for his family and that um that challenge and that that weird like you know you're in the middle of a war zone like just stay alive (laughs) but then like he's so worried about his little sister back home and he can't stop thinking about it and writing about it um that that was sort of the original inspiration for the characters that are in in this book so this one's you know set in this near future world and they're you know, so just there'll be an element to it. There's climate change, there's a fertility crisis, there's this ongoing war that's been happening for years and years. But then um, sort of in that setting, I think that the book is really about these characters um, who um, are sort of came to me as a result of, of reading those letters, although they're not, you know, they're not, they don't have much in common with my, my father or my aunt in any way, but that um, tension kind of inspired it. So those are the characters. It's a um, there's a a young veteran of a war that's been going on for decades in this near future, and he comes home from war to what's now called New Chicago, um, which is this sort of future version of Chicago post climate change. Half of the lake is dried up. Um, there's weird technology everywhere, weird rules everywhere, um, lots of changes, but also lots of things that are familiar as sort of in the dystopian tradition. It's like a couple of key things have changed, but a lot of things are recognizable. So he comes home to look for his sister who's gone missing. And meanwhile, his oldest sister has sort of miraculously become pregnant in the middle of this fertility crisis. And as a result, um, she's in kind of more danger than she knows. And that's what sort of kicks off the story. That's crazy. And, and, and we then <laughs> jump on a roller coaster and off we go. Um, you mentioned um, writing dystopia and you've got this, this uh, sort of normal world, a world we would recognize yet changed. Uh, when you're, yeah. when you're world building, uh, like that, uh, you know, and, and when we talk about science fiction and fantasy, especially, or I guess fantasy really, especially is you can just create whole worlds out of whole cloth, uh, just out of nothing at all. Right. It's, it's absolutely anything you want it to be. And a lot of science fiction too. Once we leave earth, kind of all bets are off. Um, but, uh, you know, when <laughs> you're, when you're anchoring it in a real place, yet future, yet dystopia, um, are, are there any sort of rules uh, that you kind of made for yourself, um, uh, you know, about how to portray a, a place that people will recognize yet uh, have the freedom to advance it and uh, in some cases, you know, make it worse and, and things like that? Or kind of what was your thought process in the world building for this? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can't remember who taught me this or who, where I learned this, but what I understand about sort of the difference in world building between science fiction and dystopia is in science fiction, everything is changed, but there's an element that reminds you of home or our current world. And in dystopian world, very little has changed, but there's an element that is totally different that sort of casts into contrast everything that's familiar about the, the, the world that you're in, right? So it's like either everything has changed and one thing's alike or one thing has changed and everything else is kind of, you know, similar. Um, so that was, I think, like a helpful difference for me as I was thinking about it. But that, you know, that world building is something that it was so fun. I, tr- I tried to take it, you know, I was taking it very seriously. And in that sense, you know, it's, it's a badge of honor to be included in either a you know, science fiction category or a dystopian category, because in both of those categories, you have, you know, writers who are trying to create something new that's inspired by by what we know and um, it's challenging like you said you know you have to um, think about like what are the rules of this new place um so for me the the two things that guided me as i was thinking about like what are what's different about this place was um the climate and the technology um so you know i wanted to take um the the notion of climate change 
as we're experiencing it or learning about it now and kind of take it to its next natural place if I could, but make it noticeable and kind of scary and do the same thing with um, sort of personal technology. So um, not so much like lasers and stuff like that, but more like the devices that we carry around and wear everywhere, right? So I work with a lot of um, you know, younger people in my job and all of them have these wearables um, that are helping them track um, their calories and their steps and what they eat and their heartbeat and how much sleep they get and what qu- the quality of their sleep is, which is a really interesting um, technology and it's very pervasive in the world that I'm working in anyway. And, you know, I was trying to take that to, well, what, what else could that do? What would be the next um, step of that? What if you crossed a wearable like that with something like a smartphone and also sort of thought about um, what we're doing with our own bodies right now in technology. So, so those are the two things that I was kind of focusing on as I was, as I was world building. Such a great world word, right? Like as writers, we get to world build. I know. <laughs> it I know. sounds I, so I, empowering. I, I just love the whole thought of it. You know, just I, I, I wield all of yeah, the power. Yeah. Just don't open my office door. <laughs> yes. Totally right. It makes it sound like it's this incredible thing, and really, all you're doing is like sweating over a laptop. <laughs> 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 right, right. Oh, that's so funny. So funny. Um, it, dystopia, by definition, uh, it can be uh, very depressing and very uh, hopeless. Uh, I, I think is probably a, a yeah. good word. Uh, but good dystopia uh, usually leaves us with a thread of hope um, that. That yeah. the, the setting is hopeless, um, but the the power of the human spirit and uh, you know prevails. E- even even though prevailing there may not may not be an ideal situation, it's uh, it, it's kind of like that flower that grows up through the crack in the concrete. Um, yeah, you know, that, that's the, the feeling you're left with. Um, is the, as a writer and, and you're you're uh, you're dealing with a dark place and a dark time. Um, how do you write your characters so that the the reader cares about them and we're rooting for them and uh, and, and to, to leave a thread of hope for the reader? Yeah, I, I really couldn't agree more. You know, really dystopian, like great dystopian books are not about like bleakness and, you know, the loss of hope, but really about like how we as humans challenge ourselves to be more human in times and in places where that seems hard. And so I think that, the, you know, the question of how do you create people in this world or how do you write characters in this world that can do that um, comes back to um, that question, that thing that we were talking about earlier with some um, sort of recognizability and relatability and realness. Um, and then also humor. Um, so I think that I learned a lot, like I said, in teaching the humor writing class that I did. And one of the things that I was trying to do with this book and you know again as you pointed out like when humor falls flat it falls really flat but um you know trying to obey the rules of of humor writing um that uh, kind of uh insert that element of humanity and hope you know if you can't cry all the time sometimes you've got to laugh and you you know you've got to um shine that into a dark place in order to make it, it so that the reader can see where they're going So um, some of the rules of humor writing that were kind of interesting maybe to apply to a dystopian novel where everything seems so bleak are, you know, they're like classic constructions, like the fish out of water, right? So um, take the wrong guy to the wrong kind of party and see what he can mess up. (laughs) So there's a couple of scenes like that where, um, you know, when I was teaching the humor writing classes, one one of the exercises that we did that got like some really great stuff out of out of the students consistently was um, like here is a list of the wrong kind of thing and here is person and here's a list of the party that they're going to like the kinds of parties is it a wedding is it a um, is it a anniversary party is it an engagement party is it a birthday party is it a child's birthday party and then here's a, a list of problems. So like person, party, problem. So pick one from each of those columns and go. <laughs> and that, you know, that's just like a great set of ingredients for a scene, whether you're writing, a, you know, a comic novel or a, a dystopian novel. So there's a couple of party scenes in this book where, um, you know, the main character really 
gets into trouble and um, you know, the effect of it is equal parts, I think kind of showing how bad things have gotten in this world and showing it, you know, that there's still, there's still humor and there's still humanity there. Um, well, uh, so that, the, uh, I think, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, I, no, was no, gonna, I was done. <laughs> I, I was going to say that um, talking about that, that thread of humor, um, it, Going back to what we were talking about earlier about parenthood, uh, if you've ever sat in a rocking chair for like three nights in a row with a baby that is sick and won't sleep, um, you get into some pretty dark humor, you know, with your spouse and, yeah. and with your friends. <laughs> and, you know, there's this coping mechanism that happens. And, and you look back or, you know, if you, before you had kids, if you could see what you would be like, you'd be like, oh, I would never be that horrible person. Oh, yes, you will. And, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's how you deal right. with the, you know, with, with the, uh, the, the situation you find yourself in. So, um, in a dystopian uh, society and situation, you have to believe that people would find some gallows humor and some uh, some way to make light of the darkness. Yeah, yeah, I I really think that that's true. Um, and then there's also kind of like art in at the end of the world too. Like I'm, I'm thinking of um, Station Eleven by Emily St. John yeah. Mandel, which is also about kind of the end of the world and this terrible transformed. Um, vision of America, but what people really want to do, just as much as they want to survive, is they want to make art, you know, and they want to connect with people, and they want to collect things, and they want to go to museums, and they want to um, perform plays, and write graphic novels, and yeah, that, that's such a real and human impulse, and understandable, just as understandable as, like, you know, just the need to make make light, you know. Right, right. So. Um. I'm fascinated by the title. Where where did the title come from? Yeah, the the com- a completionist is a thing that a person can be in this new world, um, and it's also I think you know that that notion of completion is something that um, is associated with a lot of things that are happening in the book. Like um, to dr- be complete is something that you know mothers are supposed to feel when they finally have a baby, right? Like your life is complete. You've had a baby. So there's that. There's also um, this like, you know, um, drawing things to a close that are sort of stubbornly refusing to end like, um, you know, a war or um, the struggle for freedom. Um, And then there's also um, sort of this notion of like a a family that's been fractured into pieces and is looking for, uh, you know, they're looking for ways to come back together again and be a complete family and to feel complete, even if pieces of it are are missing or or damaged. Um, So all of those kind of came in through the title, The Completionist. And um, and then also, I don't know if you ever read um, Never Let Me Go, by Kazuo Ishiguro, which is another really yeah. interesting, scary novel set in sort of a dystopian world where um, people are sort of raised to be harvested for their organs. And then once there's nothing left to harvest, um, they said to have completed, which was such a um, scary, evocative um, word. It just kind of haunt- That was one of the books that I read while I was researching and writing this one, just to understand, like, what do other people do with this kind of a novel and kind of a story, it was a, you know, it was a great influence. Well, my first, um, uh, when, when I got the book in the mail, uh, my, my first, uh, inclination when I looked at it, uh, I have some friends, uh, that are, are serious geeks, uh, about things and collectors yeah. and, uh, it, such completionist that if there's a book that's been released, you know, in other countries, they want to collect all of those. So they could have a different cover art right. and all of that. And, and that's my first thought. And then you start reading the book and you're like, oh, what a great juxtaposition of uh, uh, of what we think now and what could be. And then you start digging through the characters and you're like, oh, this is uh, like, like it really hit that note for me. It's fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm glad that you saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. What do you hope people take uh, away from this book? Um, you know, not that writers always have to have some underlying uh, theme or message or, you know, that we're, we're standing on a mountaintop, you know, trying to get a, a point across about something. But as a writer, what do you hope people take away from this book other than being really entertained for, you know, uh, a couple of weeks? While they read it? 
Yeah. Oh, you know, that's such a great question because you sort of, as a writer, it's so, it's such a, you can't help but feel a lot of humility when you are writing. Like, everyone is doing this. Everyone's doing it better. I'm just part of, like, a whole, like, huge history of people trying to do the same thing, and you can't help but feel kind of small. But then it helps you think, like, all right, well, wait a minute. If I'm part of this, then what do I want people to take away from what I have to offer, you know? Um, so I guess the um, – one of the things that I think this book is about is, is the effort to be a, a good man. Like that's what the main character is trying to do this entire time. And while it's, um, you know, it's about motherhood and, and it's, it's feminist, it's also about um, being a good man and being, and how women and men can partner and, and support each other better. And um, whether that's, um, you know, romantically or in a family relationship or in a brother sister way or politically like that, that, alliance um is so important and so complicated and hard but like worth worth all of that effort especially if we want to avoid um some of the things that happen in this version of the future and then i guess you know if if they take nothing else away from it i think that they you know should um should go read the handmaid's tale i guess like that's a really great book <laughs> 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 you know, it's an influence. So. <laughs> I, you, I can. Uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of A Handmaid's Tale. I, I get it, and uh, yeah, but I, you know, it's such a bleak view, and um, mm. I, I love that um, that you have have brought us a story with strong women, um, and I live in a house full of strong women, um, and and, uh, and that is a that is a, a feminist story. Uh, but also challenges us men to be the better, uh, to, to be the better versions of ourselves, and that we can be good men and good women, and that we're we're all working together. It doesn't have to be either or, and and one doesn't have to be evil so that the other can be raised up. You know, uh, I, I really yeah. love the balance that you bring to this. Thank you. I, I love the way you just put that. That's I'll, I'll say that next time somebody asks me what I want to do. <laughs> it's, it's, that's yours. It's free. You can have it. So. <laughs> right. You should charge more for that. That's well, least, you know, it's, $10. It's, it's, it, it's part of the, the full service package we provide. <laughs> um, but Siobhan, I, I absolutely love this book. Uh, the Completionist is out now everywhere. Uh, people can go pick it up. Uh, we're going to put links to all that uh, to to the the book uh, in the show notes. Uh, where can people find you online if they want to follow uh, along with with what's going on and and maybe you're intrigued by your previous work and and all that good stuff? Oh yeah. Um, well, I have a website which is my first and last name dot com. Um, and I'm also on Twitter as Shavonster and um, love it. would love to see you there. Yeah. <laughs> well, Siobhan, uh, we, we wish you much success on the book launch. Thank you. Uh, we're we're going to do everything we can to, uh, to help uh, tell people about it. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. What a great conversation this was. It's always fun to talk about writing with people who really care about it. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. On the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, Joey locked the doors of the Washington Irving Chapel and checked the windows from the outside, making sure that the cemetery offices were dark. Satisfied, he donned a knit cap and trudged uphill to the employee parking lot. He'd forgotten how desolate the grounds became at night. A fog had gathered, blurring the moon and stars. His rusty Volkswagen Beetle, christened Ladybug by Jason, sat in shadow alongside his dad's white van, which bore an image of the horseman and the cemetery's web address. Joey swept a palmful of condensation from Ladybug's windshield and fumbled for his keys. He heard a laugh, high and young. He froze. Hello? He shook off goose flesh and found his key. He started the engine and backed out, headlights off, praying not to knock over a headstone again. A child stood on the hillside amongst the graves. You okay, kid? 
Cemetery's closed. He turned on his headlights. The child vanished. Joey idled in the drive, frowning. What had just happened? He turned off the headlights and waited for his eyes to adjust. The silhouette reappeared. The child stood in the road now, blocking his way. He and the ghost stared at each other. He bit his tongue and squinted over the steering wheel. He couldn't resolve the ghost's features, only a tiny body in... Ruffles? Yes, a dress. A little girl with shoulder-length hair. The figure crouched, threw its arms over its head and skipped away. A giggle followed after. The ghost skipped up the hill, turned around, and beckoned through the fog. Please come. Joey shook his head. No way. Ain't gonna happen. But he felt compelled to follow. What could a little girl do to him after all? He would keep a safe distance. The gravel sounded like soft rain beneath his tires. It drew him helplessly, past weeping cypresses and mausoleums blue with moonlight. He followed the giggle, the skipping ribbons, the little body made of shadow and quicksilver. The north end of the cemetery grounds rose to a steep wooded slope. The ghost had led him to Section 77, the northernmost boundary of the cemetery, but he'd lost her. He killed the engine, summoned his courage, and climbed out. The night air brought him fully awake. Where are you? he whispered, scanning the graves. A row of diseased hemlock trees stood at the fence line. Joey knew them well. They were dying, infested by some parasite called, he fished for the name, Wooly Adelgig. His crew had cut them back many times, lopping off limbs and heads, trying to save them. The hemlocks had grown back twisted and tormented. They stood as a row of grotesque sentinels guarding the threshold of the forest. The ghost climbed the slope, spun at the fence, and sat hugging her knees. The black mass of the Rockefeller State Park Preserve loomed behind her. What do you want? Joey whispered. Play. He stepped forward, hands shaking. He just wanted to see her face, the face of a real ghost. To see the curve of her cheek, the sparkle that might have been her left eye. Come and play, Joey. He froze. The sound of his name terrified him. She pointed over his shoulder. Play with us. He turned and realized his mistake. He'd driven with his eyes on the girl, trying not to lose her, never looking behind. They had been followed. <laughs>